Associate Director of Institu Institutional Relations for Rice University's OpenStax. So I am a Rice employee. This is a Rice University initiative. And so I am actually going to, now that you've seen me, I'm going to turn off the camera real quick uh, just so that we can go ahead and focus on the presentation and then I will start the camera back up for questions and answers. So uh, first a little bit about me. This is me. Uh, I, I joke that this is me pre-college administrator bags under my eyes. Uh, I was the marketing director at Kellogg Community College in Battle Creek, Michigan at the time. Uh, but where I want to start the story is much younger, actually. So my mother worked at a community college starting when she was pregnant for me through retire her retirement. And uh, as a little girl, I used to go. She worked in the library in the evening. So I would go with her to the library to do my homework and things like that. And a lot of times, uh, my mom and I, during her break, would walk with students down to the bookstore. And her students would either hand her cash or not. And my mom would go through the bookstore lines and buy textbooks. And at the time, I didn't really understand what was going on. But now I understand very strongly what was going on. Uh, so in a lot of cases, my mom had work study students who were really struggling financially. And so she was using her 20% off at the bookstore to purchase their books for them. And then sometimes outright buying them uh, with her tithe money to keep those kids in school. So I also saw this when I was working at Kellogg Community College with a lot of our students really struggling to stay in school. And that's really what drove me to work on the OpenStax project. So now a little bit about Rice University's story. Rice University began working in open educational resources in 1999 under Dr. Richard Baranek, who is a computer science professor here at Rice. And we, uh, and so the project was originally called Connections, now called CNX, and it was an open educational resource repository where faculty could upload any resources they want and share them and other faculty could take them down. And it was just this wonderful sharing environment. And so we looked at that and we said, okay, there's over 40,000 pieces of content in this repository, including full college textbooks. That's it, we're good. We should never have to do anything again. Students should never have to buy books again. All the content that's needed is there. Uh, but what really happened was that not many faculty were using that and not many faculty even knew about it. Uh, and so we really had to take a look at why that was. And we learned a lot of lessons along the way in, in, in the path of forming OpenStax. So what have we learned? The first thing that we learned is that faculty really need high quality content. So while faculty were uploading the resources and downloading them, they were very concerned about the quality of them. They liked the idea of being able to build and modify their own resources, but they really wanted to start with something really concrete to begin with, a, a build, you know, a modify model versus build up from the ground. And they wanted to be reassured of the quality. So talking with faculty in 2012, when we retooled as OpenStax, we said, every one of our books is going to be quality compared to a com commercial textbook. And that means that we will meet standard scope and sequence. We will hire experts to write the content. We'll also hire an extensive review team of peer reviewers and industry experts to peer review the content. We'll put it through the same rigorous process and editorial process as a publisher. And we'll, go, we'll make sure that we have a model that will allow us to do those regular errata industry updates. So the second thing that we learned is that we needed help as a nonprofit. While we can sustain these books at a very low cost and are able to sustain them, we did need startup funding and we also needed the, the funding to develop these books. Each of these books is very expensive. They, can, they start at around $500,000 each to develop. And so we do rely on generous foundations to develop the content or to pay for the content development through grants to us. Once the content is developed, then we can sustain it, but we do really appreciate their support. 
We also learned that we really needed to focus on scale. And so the big question, and I continue to ask this question whenever I am working with a college or university on their OER initiative is, how many students will be impacted by this? That's the real question. So if you look at the OpenStax library of books, what you'll notice is that um, given our mission, that they all meet the freshman core, given our mission of going ahead and really working on driving down costs for students through OpenStax books, we have a lot of criteria that go into which books we choose to publish, but there are two main criteria. Number one, how many students are taking the course in the U.S. so far? So for example, we know that there are a million students a year taking U.S. history. There are a million students a year taking psychology. The second criteria, how expensive are the textbooks that are currently in the market? It's not uncommon for us to see a $350 physics book. It's not uncommon for us to see a $300 statistic book. I find it ironic, but economics is one of the most expensive textbooks in the market. To give you another example, Affordable Learning Georgia out of the University System of Georgia created a list of the top 100 undergraduate courses across the system in terms of enrollment and then map them to open educational resources. And what they do is they provide grants to faculty who do teach one of those top highly enrolled courses and encourage them to adopt OER. The other thing we learned is that how many other schools will utilize this? So going back to the original template of Rice, what we found was that the faculty member that was uploading things to our repository would, would use them and perhaps one other faculty. But what we're looking for is really to do the scale. How do you actually get a lot of different schools utilizing these resources? And that's really where we landed on the quality aspect of these. So I'm very excited to say that OpenStax is now in 3,400 different schools across the world. We have 900,000 students using our books this year alone. And I'll talk a little bit about that more, but we're looking for those high impact where it doesn't just, it doesn't just impact one school, but impacts a lot of schools across the country and maybe across the world. The other thing we had to learn was how to measure success correctly. Uh, so what we learned is that you really need to measure outcomes, not actions, when you're working with OER. And what I mean by this is that when we look at, when I call a university or a college and I say, how's your OER initiative going? How are you doing at encouraging faculty while protecting academic freedom to Incre to increase their use of OER, and they'll say, oh, Nicole, it's going great. We have a committee, we meet monthly, we held a workshop, we had 10 faculty attend the workshop. And then I say, okay, well, how many faculty now are using OER? How many students have you impacted? And what's your savings numbers? Uh, and what's your student success numbers? And they either don't know or there hasn't been an impact. So when I'm working with colleges and universities, and I encourage you to as well, Double check and make sure you're measuring the things that matter. The number of faculty using OER, the number of students impacted, the amount of savings. So we use a calculation here at OpenStax of 98.57 for every publisher textbook we replace. And that's based on an aggregate in terms of students being able to rent the book, buy it used, things like that. If you want to make your life very easy, $100 is what a lot of groups use. Another thing that we learned very quickly is that it's really important to look at what formats do students actually use and how can you make sure that they have access in those. So at this point, I want to go out to the website just to give you an idea of how OER works. And the first thing that I want to highlight is that I am not logged into this website. So this is if I was a student in your class on the very first day of class and you told me that my book was free online and low cost in print and gave me the website. Students do not need to create an account. So I'm going to click on subjects. And I always like to show our college physics book since it was our original book. We're very proud of our original book. Uh, so these are the different ways that the book is available. The first one is an online view. And this is a responsive design view, which means that it reads very well on a Kindle, iPhone, iPad, Samsung, Galaxy, you name the device. 
faculty really like this view because they can hyperlink to different sections of the text in their LMS, on course websites, things like that, in email, and you can see that I can navigate around very quickly to get to the text. The second version is also completely free, which is our PDF, and for time and download speed, I'll click low resolution. So the PDF is also completely free. The students can save it, and it never expires. So I joke that they will have it as long as they can remember where they saved it. Uh, it's, they could print it if they so choose, but I don't recommend that because our books are rather thick. This one is 1,400 pages. And so by the time a student paid for printing of this or ink, they'd be better off buying a print copy. But they do have the ability to do that if they so choose. All right. So those are the two free versions that we have available. And we also have print. So this is interesting. What we found after starting this is that there are still a decent number of students who do want to purchase a print copy. And nationally, we found that it's approximately 10% of students who want to print, purchase a print copy of an open sex book. So we do sell those. They're hardcover, full color textbooks. They look just like any other publisher textbook that you would get except the price tag. Uh, so our books, we sell them basically at cost, and de so depending on the thickness, they range anywhere from $29 to $65. And you can see that the students can order them from Amazon, or more important, they can order them through your college bookstore. And that's so important because if students have some sort of financial aid or bookstore funding they want to be able to use, we want them to be able to do that and keep the bookstore involved in that process. Uh, so that's available as well. For some of our books, the Beneficious Foundation has donated Bookshare versions, which are the accessibility files. And I'll talk a little bit more about the online accessibility in a minute. Uh, but these are the DAISY files and things like that. We also have an iBook version of the book available. So this is a version of the book that's built specifically for the iPad platform. Students can download it and they don't need internet access. It looks real pretty. They have the ability to take notes, flashcards, annotate, et cetera. And those are $6.99. But again, the students don't have to buy anything. And in fact, the vast majority of the students don't. They just jump between the online view and the PDF, depending on what device they have in the situation. And I do want to emphasize that they do tend to jump between the two. Students like having the ability to have different formats available given a situation. Before I scroll down, I also want to highlight this Adopt This Book button. If you choose to use our resources as a main or supplemental resource, please let us know. Uh, we are a nonprofit, and while we do have a sustainability model, our grant funders do want to know who is who, uh, or the numbers, they don't know who, but the numbers of faculty who are using the books, as well as the number of students that are using the books. So please take two minutes and fill out that form. Scrolling down, we do have some instructor resources available to you. Uh, for this one, we have a solution manual and PowerPoint slides and some other things as well. Now, these do require a login to access, of course, because we don't want students getting access to those. You can sign up for an account here. It does. It is about a three-day process to get an account because we do manually verify that you are a faculty member. So please have some patience with us that, but once you are approved, you will have access to those as well. It depends on the subject and the grant funding, what ones we have available. Uh, so please check your, your particular book that you're interested in using for those. Something else that's been very exciting here at OpenStax is about a year and a half ago, we started getting emails from faculty that said, you know, your instructor resources are okay, um, but I've developed additional instructor resources around your books, and I would love to donate them back to OpenStax. And so what we've done is we have created a partnership with OER Commons, which is an OER repository, where faculty can get online and discuss with one another, as well as share resources with one another. Now, this is a brand new initiative at OpenStax. We've only been doing this a couple months, so there's only a little bit of resources so far for the books, but I do encourage you to check there. And if you do create something around the OpenStax books, please consider donating it back to the other faculty here so that they have those available as well. 
scrolling down, a lot of faculty came to us and said, you know, the books are wonderful, but we really need some sort of homework or courseware to go with the books or some clicker technology, things like that. And we kind of like the one we have and we'd like choice. We'd like to choose the one we use and if possible, continue to use the one we're using. And they told us how frustrating it was if you're using, for example, a Pearson book that you have to use a Pearson homework system. So what we have done is we have partnered with a wide variety of independent as well as publisher homework systems for our books. And it is an open market system, which means you can choose to use any of these with the book or none of these in the book. But the most important thing is that you are in control of that. You get to choose what you use with the book and not. Most of these run about $40 or less, so they're very reasonable, especially given the fact that the students are getting the book for free. And if you choose to use one of these resources with our books, part of that student fee will come back to us as a mission support fee. And that's the main fees that we use to not only sustain our, our nonprofit, but be able to fund revisions of our text. Scrolling down further, you'll see student resources. I highly recommend the Student Getting Started Guide. It's a nice one-page PDF that lets students know how to access the resources. Scrolling down more, you'll see the ISBN and the very important Creative Commons license, which tells you that while these books do have a copyright, we are giving you automatic permission to reuse, remix, distribute, redistribute, revise, whatever you want to do, as long as you provide attribution. We also have an errata tool for reporting errata, as well as seeing the errata that was submitted previously. All errata does go back through the peer review process. And once it's approved, if it's something small like a typo, we might update it right away. Otherwise, we do major errata and, and industry updates once a year during the summer. And the reason for that is that we don't want students sitting in the class with a print copy that are looking at something different online that can be very confusing. We also do revise our books when it's pedagogically necessary to do so. So for example, we already have a second edition of our sociology book. And at the very bottom here, you can see our accessibility statement as well. So that's all there for you to review as well. Okay, so again, one of the things that we really learned was that it also had to be sustainable. And that's where those really partner resources. One of the biggest worries and questions that we get from faculty is, how do I know the content's going to be kept up? How do I know you're going to be there in a couple of years? How do I know that revisions will be done? And through the sustainability model, we are absolutely able to do that. And again, using them is completely optional, but a lot of faculty do find they're helpful. And also we found that faculty needed more than a book. And you saw this when we were on the website that there are things that you need beyond just the content in terms of homework and labs, PowerPoints, pronunciation guides, things like that. Another key thing that we learned is if you, if you are starting an OER initiative, you really need to have a leader. Uh, it's really important to have one person who is held responsible for really driving your OER initiative on your campus. But of course, you want to include everyone in terms of faculty and administrators, librarians, instructional support, your bookstore, disability services, everybody that you can. So how does this really help students learn? Because that's at the core of what we're trying to do and what you all are trying to do. Well, the first thing is that it removes a major barrier for students in terms of pricing. And I really like how US Perk put this a couple years ago when they, or a year ago, when they said that the average student would have to work 28 hours at a minimum wage job just to purchase a single $200 textbook. And in most cases, they're having to purchase a lot of those $200 textbooks. And uh, so I promise these aren't your prices, uh, but I did go to a random university and I looked up their class schedule, looked at what books they were using, and then went to their college bookstore site and looked up the prices of these books. And as you can see, just with three books, they could be saving students a million dollars a year. Faculty tell us all the time one of the most frustrating things to you in terms of being able to teach students and, and get through all your learning outcomes is the fact that students are sitting there without the book. Uh, so in this study, 65% of students said they had decided against buying a textbook. I've seen up to 80%. 
We've also seen this in the Florida virtual campus numbers in terms of students taking fewer courses, not registering for courses, dropping a course, or even withdrawing from courses due to the high cost of textbooks. On the flip side, in terms of efficacy, there have been 11 peer-reviewed studies of about 49,000 students, and 93% of the students in those studies did as well or better using OER. And as well, we consider still a win because if students are saving the money and they're not doing worse in the course, that's definitely a win. Um, I recently heard John Hilton, who did this analysis, talk about this, and that other 7% is very interesting as well in that a lot of students who couldn't afford the textbook dropped the course, that was one of the, one of the courses, and so they think that that's the reason that there was some student, some courses where students did better in the course with the paid materials because only the students left that could pay for the materials were in that course. And we also see the efficacy in terms of uh, retention and completion. On the flip side, students said they really do take less credits and things like that and draw, withdraw classes because of high textbook costs. And we see that come out in the research on the other side as well. One of the big things for us beyond just affordability though is students having the freedom to access the content wherever they are, whenever they are, and however they learn. In terms of different formats for different devices and situations, as I mentioned, it's very common for a student to use the PDF sometimes and the web view sometimes, and if they bought a print copy, the same student might use the print copy at home, the PDF in their class, and the, the online view when they're studying or in labs. Being able to share the information with each other, having that instant and unlimited access, and not only that, but having permanent access. They should have no excuse for not having this content anymore in terms of it, an access code expiring or reselling the book back or whatever. They will always have that access to that content. And being able to use the content in their work legally as well as how they study. So for example, I was at the University of Texas San Antonio and a veteran student spoke up about how he uses our PDF to develop his own study guides by copying and pasting from the PDF and publishes those for other students as well. So one of the big things, this is the standard definition of open educational resources from the Hewlett Foundation. The underlining is my own because I really want to talk about how this intellectual property license is so important and the fact that their free use and repurposing is so important. We're starting to see the rise of something that we call OER-based materials. So this is where a uh, for-profit publisher is, is taking the OER content and mixing it with their own content, which is copyrighted, and then charging the students a fee to use it. So we see a lot of concerns about this in terms of students having to buy the content because it's mixed with the copyright and uh, having those copyright restrictions so they no longer can change it into different formats or modify it or use study guides or any of that stuff. And they really don't have much choice in purchasing the content anymore. It, it, these, these are usually done through access codes or something like that. So it's, they can't buy them used. They can't buy from Amazon, things like that. In terms of faculty freedom, we're going back to limited academic freedom with this in terms of not being able to use the materials as you see fit because you are based under those copyright and you're under limited choice. So our editor-in-chief uh, came up with this phrase, and I love it. If they are bringing you donuts, it's not OER. Uh, the schools may buy you treats, and we appreciate Colorado State buying treats, uh, but OER providers do not have the funding to do that. So if they're doing that, it's probably OER-based. And before I let this subject go, one more thing about this and why that post-course access to core content matters. Number one, courses span multiple semesters. So oftentimes students will have to rebuy access to their content if a course spans multiple semesters or whether they have to retake the course or reference for advanced courses. A lot of faculty um, that we have who are adopters will say, you know, I also use your statistics book, for example, in my advanced psychology courses because my students need a refresher in statistics and I don't want to have them have to buy a book for that. 
So things like that. And then studying for those higher education entrance exams and certification exams. I was out with a group the other day and met a young man who was studying for an MCAT. And he was worried about having the resources because he'd sold all his books back. And so I helped him find some resources so that he could do that. So the MCAT, GRE, CPA, GMAT, all of those. On the faculty side, the faculty have a lot more freedom too. In terms of adoption, we've really made it as easy as possible to be able to use these because every student has that immediate and unlimited access. They do meet standard scope and sequence. We're not choosing your technology partners for you. You get to choose those. You get to use and edit and adapt the books how you see fit. You get to use whatever formats you want. We're not going to choose that. You own the content and you only move to a new edition if you want to. So one of our promises to you is if we publish a new edition of a book and you say, I still want to use the old edition, we will keep the PDF and web view versions of the old edition on our website so that you can transition only if and when you want to. A little bit more about this adaptation. So our books, other than Calculus, are li licensed under the Creative Commons by license. Calculus is a little bit different under CC by NCSA. And this really gives you the ability to modify the content as you see fit. So this is a really cool example. On the left is our general chemistry book that we published. And the University of Connecticut came to us and said, this is a lovely, wonderful book. We really like it. We'd like to use it but we teach atoms first. So we need an atoms first version of it, uh, which means we're gonna reorganize the content. But they were thinking about how many schools would use this, and they said, you know, we just don't want it to be just us using this content. We want it available to everyone. So we'd like to put it back under the OpenStax name. And so we said, that's great, we would have to get it peer reviewed, and at the current moment, we don't have the grant funding to do that. And so they went, they went back and a couple of weeks later, they came back to us and said, our undergraduate student government association is providing us with a grant to revise this book to be an Adams first and for you to peer review it so that not only our school, but all schools will be able to use this. And I understand that you'll start using the Adams first at Colorado State University, which means you have the University of Connecticut to thank for that as well as so that's really exciting. In terms of community, I talked about this already, but faculty being able to take our resources and modify and adapt and then turn around and republish them and reshare them for other faculty to use. That's a really novel idea and it's really a great way to build that community where faculty don't have to do this alone and they don't have to worry about sharing copyrighted materials. They absolutely have the right to share our resources and share anything they've modified with our resources with one another. And then localization. This is a really neat example. This is from um, a school in Mexico where they contacted us and said, your concepts of biology book is fabulous. We really want to translate in Spanish. Can we do that? And we said, yes, of course you do. Under the Creative Commons license, you have automatic permission to do that. So they translated our entire concepts of biology book into Spanish and are able to use it for their students. And if you just search YouTube, you'll find so many videos based around OER. Uh, this one's a real quick one that's a reading guide of our content where a faculty member is guiding students through this reading. And that's actually our textbook content on the screen there. So let's be clear, if this was a copyrighted publisher content, this would be illegal. But because it's an open educational resource, it's not. And it's working. As I mentioned earlier, we have over 3,400 schools currently using the OpenStax text. And you'll see it really runs the gamut of Ivy Leagues, community college, four years, private schools, specialty schools, all of the above. And uh, here is the list of faculty that we've heard are using our books at Colorado State University. So we are very excited to have you all uh, utilizing open educational resources for your course. And I just found out about Benjamin Reynolds, and Ingrid Lockman, and Carlos Olivio utilizing the chemistry book, the general chemistry, as well as Adam Spurs. And then we were very excited to find that in this year, the Babson College Survey reported that we are being used in 10% of introductory courses in the US. 
And we also have a series of partner and affiliate schools. So these are schools that work directly with me. This is my main work. We, again, don't have sales reps here at OpenStax. So I work with these schools as a grant-funded consultant to help them increase the use of OER on their campuses. And we've saved students $166 million. So we're very excited about that. So that is the end of my presentation. And I will turn the camera back on so that we can go through your questions.